colour doesn't exist, technically. That does sound like an attack on common sense, but it isn't. The sky exists, your shirt exists, the paint on your wall exists. What isn't sitting out in the world is colour, as an objective thing you can point at and measure the same way you point at a rock. Physics gives you wavelengths, numbers that describe how light vibrates. Your brain takes that raw data and turns it into an experience. Light hits the eye. Sensors sample different parts of the spectrum. The brain compares those signals and settles on a hue, a saturation, and a brightness almost instantly. That process is shaped by the hardware in your head, the life you've lived, and the words your language hands you. So the word red points at a private feeling inside you. Nobody can hand that feeling to anyone else. There's no test that proves your red is my red. We agree on words. We both point at the same stoplight and call it red. But the actual inner movie, the raw experience, is sealed off in each of our heads. It's possible that what I call red would look completely different if you could somehow step into my brain. We'll never know. Philosophers call these raw first-person sensations qualia. Knowing all the physics doesn't give you the feeling because what it feels like can't be precisely measured. You'd understand this better if you knew Mary's Room, a thought experiment by philosopher Frank Jackson. Mary is a brilliant scientist who knows everything about the physics of colour, wavelengths, optics and neuroscience. But she lived her whole life in a black and white room, never having actually seen colour. One day she steps outside and sees red for the first time. The question is, did Mary learn something new? If you say yes, and most people do, then knowing all the science doesn't equal knowing the experience. It shows there's a gap between describing the world and feeling it. The same gap exists for pain, for joy, and for the way a song lands in your chest. Colour gets stranger when you realise that across history, humans haven't always carved up the spectrum the way we do now. Take Homer, the ancient Greek poet, and one of the most influential ones, if I might add. When he described the sea, he didn't call it blue. He called it wine dark. In fact, in thousands of lines of text, he never once used the word blue. That absence caught scholars' attention because the Greeks' eyes were not different from ours. Languages tend to name dark and light first, then red, then yellow or green. Blue often comes later. Linguists like Berlin and Kay documented that pattern across cultures. Field studies back it up. When researchers test colour discrimination in communities without a stable word for blue, people often struggle to single it out. The Himba people of Namibia, for example, use many words for shades of green, but treat blue as less distinct. They're faster at telling apart greens than we are, and slower at finding a lone blue among greens. Language guides what the mind sharpens and what it lets blur. Biology adds obvious variation because not all eyes are built the same. Most humans have three types of cones in their retinas, tuned to different ranges of wavelength. That gives us what we call trichromatic vision. But some people are born with only two functioning cones, which is what we call colour blindness. To them, reds and greens can blend together, and blues and purples can collapse into the same shade. They don't live in a black and white movie, as the stereotype goes, but their colour world is smaller, compressed. Common forms are red-green deficiencies called protonopia and deuteranopia. Blue-yellow problems are rarer and called tritonopia. You can show this instantly with an Ishihara plate, a simple dotted test that reveals red-green differences. On the other hand, there are rare cases, often in women, of tetrachromacy. Four cones instead of three. This can expand the colour space dramatically, letting them see millions of subtle distinctions others can't imagine. Their rainbow is literally richer than ours, so even among humans, the spectrum is not universal. And once you look at how other species experience colour, the differences explode. Bees can see ultraviolet, a part of the spectrum invisible to us. Flowers that look plain to our eyes often have UV patterns, like landing strips pointing straight to nectar, designed for bee vision. Birds often have four cones too, some tuned beyond our range, giving them colours we can't even name. Mantis shrimp have up to 16 types of photoreceptors, Though how they actually process that flood of input is still debated. To them, the ocean is painted in a palette we couldn't begin to picture. When you realise this, our version of colour feels less like the truth and more like one translation among many possible ones. Physics complicates things further, because out there, in the external world, there is no such thing as colour. There are only electromagnetic waves bouncing around. A banana doesn't have yellowness. It reflects certain wavelengths more than others and your visual system interprets that balance as yellow. Change the light source and the banana changes. Colour isn't fixed to objects, 
It depends on context, lighting, and your nervous system's interpretation. Think of that dress from 2015. Is it blue and black or white and gold? Millions of people stared at the same picture, but the brain's unconscious guess about lighting split the world in half. Even now, if you comment down what colors you see, you'd be surprised how many people would disagree. That's because color isn't out there in the pixels. It's a judgment your brain makes. If that wasn't enough, even your memory of color can be unreliable. Studies show that when people recall the color of an object, say a common fruit, their minds often shift it toward a more stereotypical shade. You remember a strawberry as a stronger, brighter red than it really was. Your brain isn't just seeing color in the present, it's editing it in hindsight. If you want to test this, stare at a saturated color for 30 seconds, then look at your wall. You'll get a complementary after image. This is adaptation, the visual system balancing signals. There are conditions like synesthesia, where senses bleed into each other. Some people involuntarily see letters or sounds as colored. For them, the letter A might always glow red, or the number two might flash as blue. These are genuine perceptions, which suggests that color itself is more flexible, more entangled with the wiring of the brain than we usually think. So if out in the universe there are no colors, just vibrations of light, then each species and each individual might perceive those vibrations differently. Language can reshape the categories, biology can expand or shrink the palette, brains can impose illusions, stereotypes, even cross-sensory fusions, which means that your blue is indeed not my blue, and neither is the universe's blue, because the universe doesn't have one. Philosophically, science hasn't and cannot yet show that two ordinary non-colorblind people experience qualia in exactly the same way. The inverted spectrum thought experiment illustrates why people could be internally shifted while behaving identically, because language and action map to function, not raw feeling. No third-person test will hand you someone else's private sensation. That remains an open boundary. Does that mean it's likely that your blue is my red? Not really. Biology and shared environment push strongly toward alignment. We evolved on the same planet under similar skies. Our visual systems are broadly similar. Language and social learning converge our labels. The plausible scenario is, most of our colour experiences overlap enough for practical life. But science suggests we already don't all see colour in exactly the same way. The differences might be small, but they are real. And that is enough to make you wonder how private our experiences really are. Maybe that even explains why people differ so wildly in taste, in preference, in what feels beautiful. Maybe we're all walking around with slightly different inner worlds. That is not a flaw. It is what makes life richer.